Okay, I think we can get started. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session on parquet column encryption and data masking. Today, we're going to talk about how you can use column encryption to secure your data at the lowest layer. We will also touch on the new data masking feature that we are actively working on. My name is Pavi, and I'm a software engineer in Uber's data infra org. I'm a member of the Big Data Security Team, and I have been working on Parquet Column Level Access Control for the past two years. I'm also joined today by Shin Li, who is a technical lead manager in Uber Data Infra. He is also a Parquet uh, committer, and he's been working on column encryption at Uber since the very start. Let's go over the agenda on what we're going to be covering today. First of all, we're going to go over the motivation of CLAC. So like, why exactly do, uh, do we want column encryption and what is it? Next, we're going to go over how CLEC fits into a typical stack. So we look at a typical data stack and talk about how we can integrate column encryption into it. After that, we're going to take a closer look on how exactly column encryption works. We'll dive into the Apache Parquet implementation, as well as look into the details of the other systems involved to bring column level access control to production. And lastly, we'll talk about the new feature we are currently working on called data masking. We'll talk about the initial design and the features which we are planning. I want to highlight that this feature is currently in POC phase and a lot is subject to change, but we definitely see data masking as an important feature for the smooth productionizing of column level access control in an organization. OK, so what is going to be covered and what are we not going to cover? We'll talk about how to achieve fine-grained access control within your Hadoop data lake. We'll emphasize how Parquet column encryption fits within a typical stack, and we'll try to focus on technologies, both the open source ones and the internal tools that we built, to support this technology. However, please note that we're not covering all aspects of data security. This isn't legal advice or legal guidance. OK, let's jump in on why we need column encryption. So there's several reasons. First of all, column encryption allows us to protect data at the lowest level by going through the Parquet file format. This means we are protecting data at the file level, and it ultimately protects the data from all possible access paths. Secondly, an important observation that can be made is that in a typical wide data set, there's only a small percentage of columns that are actually confidential. By enabling fine-grained control over your data, you're able to protect exactly what needs to be protected. The consequence of column level access control is that we can open up data sets while still protecting the critical data appropriately. In practice, it is not uncommon uh, in the data analytics world for a table to have hundreds of columns, but only a few handful of columns need to be protected. All right, let's go over a query comparison so you can kind of see the, the uh, what the difference between CLEC and no CLEC is in practice. Uh, so on top here, we have a few no CLEC examples where we only have table level control enabled. So we have two examples here, example one and example two, and the results of these queries. And, and there's either uh, access denied sign or a check mark uh, based on if the query is passed. So in example one, uh, we have a select on four columns, and the columns are A, ID, email, and B. Email and uh, ID are highlighted in red because they're considered sensitive data. And the result of this uh, is that the user's access is denied because they don't have permissions to read a table with sensitive data. Now in example two, we have a similar select but this time, the user is not actually trying to read any sensitive information. They're only trying to read A and B, which are not sensitive. However, under table level control, the user's access is still denied because permissions can only be controlled at table level granularity. Without CLAC, we have to block all access to that table, both PII access and non-PII access for that user. 
Okay, now in the bottom part, we have, uh, we can look at some queries in the CLAC enabled world. So example three here, we have a similar query to example one where we're trying to read all these, all these columns, including ID and email, which are sensitive. Uh, and this time we still have to uh, reject this query because the user doesn't have access. However, now in example four, when the user only uh, does not query any sensitive columns, the user's uh, query is permitted. Basically, we only block actual PII queries, but we now allow non-PII queries to pass. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass it to Shin Li, who will go more in depth on how CLAC fits into the typical stack, and he'll dive more into the Parquet internals. Thanks, Vivi. Uh, let's talk about it from the use case perspective. What does the data lake stack, stack looks like? Um, why the big data file format is important and why we have the access control at the file format level. So in a typical big data stack, the user considers the query to query the data for many different reasons, for uh, business intelligence, for the machine learning, et cetera. The query sends us through the query engines, have Spark, Presto, et cetera, eventually arrive their uh, data storage, maybe HDFS. It could be other system, uh, file, file system. So the data return to the core engines, the core engine do the joins, the filters, et cetera, and give back to the user. Next slide, please. Now the challenge here is the access to the storage could be from any angle with any access. It could be a SQL, it could be non-SQL, it could be direct access. The user can download the file directly. And the HDFS, for example, it is a file system. It doesn't have the concept of color. Next slide, please. Now, the file format came to the picture. The big, like, the big data file format is between the layer of compute and storage. The Pocket library, for example, is linked with the query engines like Presto, Spark, Hive, et cetera. But the data that is structured is stored in the file system, like the HDFS. So you can imagine it is the right place in the, in the big data file format to have the column encryption in place. Next slide, please. So the high level approach here is let's do the access control at the file format. And we only encrypt the sensitive columns in the HDFS. Let's talk about it by pivot. And also the access control to the column is done by the access control on the keys in the KMS. You have the permission to the key and then you have the permission, you have the ability to decrypt the column. Otherwise, because access denied. Next slide. Let's room in the Pokwe uh, for a little bit more detail and build up the context here. So Pokwe is a column storage. The data from the same column will be pulled together. That will make the data smaller, make the query faster. Now, for a given Pokwe file, there's a footer it has the schema, have the metadata, et cetera, or the needed information for you to access the file. Now, the, the data of the file is divided into the different row groups. For a given row group, it's divided into the different column chunks. So each column chunk is corresponding to a column. Now, for a given column chunk, it's further divided into pages. So page is the unit that we do the encoding, compression, and encryption. Next slide, please. Let's look into the column encryption conceptually from a high level. So in this example, you have a table which only have two columns, C1, column one, C2, column two. So column one is a plain text, not sensitive. Column two is sensitive. In the red path, which is also encryption path, the Pokwe application, for example, Spark, 
Presto, etc. So it invokes the Poker API and tells Poker that, hey, column two is sensitive and please encrypt it with this key. So pass the key to the Poker library. Poker library will just eat to the encryption. Now you can encrypt the data. Now Poker will also store the key metadata along with the encrypted data and send to the air for the storage to store it. The storage could be any. It doesn't have to be HDFS. It could be S3, etc. Now, on the reading path, when the reader gets the pocket file, reads the metadata, and know that column two is encrypted. Also, you can get the key metadata. So with this key metadata, the reader should be able to get the key from the key MS and do the decryption by the pocket library if they have the permission to do so. If they do not have permission, they will get access denied or mask the value. Here we will talk about the data masking in the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, up. One second. Yeah. Conceptually, the encryption and decryption is clear. But when you rule out the query engines, remember, Poké library is just a library that build, is linked by the query engines. When you rule out Spark, request, et cetera, there are several problems. Now, the problem is, how do you define that which column is sensitive and what kind of key or which key that you want to use to do the encryption? What we find out that it is convenient to define these settings along with the schema. For example, for a column, you have a schema, you have a column name, you have type, nullable or not, or you can define this column is sensitive or not. If it is, what kind of key ID you are going to use to get the key for the encryption. So that will be along with the schema. So we obtain the existing schema to have these settings we call it out as crypto settings. Now, the, we obtain the Poké Writer support to convey these crypto settings schema. Now, we also develop a crypto retriever as a plugin, which will consume those settings. And the plugin will build up the encryption properties based on the settings. Now, this is an example of the spark in the diagram. So you can define the crypto settings in the schema of spark called struct field. Let's say the column one is defined as encryption as sensitive encryption with some key ID. And then the Poké write support we extended just convert that to the Poké schema. Now the crypto settings will do the crypto retriever will do the magic work and build up the encryption properties based on the settings and invoke the Poké API to do the encryption work. Next slide, please. So Poké encryption has several options. One is whether or not to encrypt the footer. So footer has all the schema, metadata, et cetera, which is needed to access the file. So if you want to encrypt the footer, so any column that encrypted, you want to access, the user need to have the permission to access the footer. So encrypt the footer definitely will give you more security, but it will add more complexity uh, to your encryption. Second, for the encryption algorithm, Poké encryption support AES GCM and AES CTR. So GCM is on top of CTR. It provided the in, provided the integrity checks actually. So so um, it not only prevent the privilege unprivileged reading but also pre prevent the malicious mutation to the original data. And third, third option is encryption with authentication. So if you use a GCM, you can provide the additional authentication data. We call the AAD. Now on the decryption, if you provide the correct AAD, you can decrypt the data, otherwise it will fail. So it provides more security, but it adds a complexity. So you can see all the options is a trade-off between complexity and 
as security and the overhead. Next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can manage the encryption keys which are necessary to do the actual encryption and decryption. First of all, the Parquet encryption implementation is not restricted to any particular key management service solution. It's designed so any KMS could be plugged in to do the job of key management. The key metadata that is relevant to Parquet is just a generic byte array which maps to a key in any KMS. Basically, you are free to choose from the vast array of KMS offerings. Some examples include uh, the open source family, including Hadoop KMS, Ranger KMS, and there's several cloud KMS providers like AWS K KMS and many others. Now let's take a closer look at the integration and interface between uh, the KMS and Parquet. The integration is controlled through a plugin which is added to any query engine which needs to support column encrypted tables. Essentially, this plugin is just a wrapper of a KMS client with a few extra features. It is responsible for taking the key metadata from Parquet and retrieving encryption and decryption keys from the KMS but it also has the job of serializing and deserializing the key metadata into a byte array, which can be, then be stored by Parquet. And lastly, the plugin also controls additional uh, encryption properties, like the ones that Shinli mentioned, like setting the encryption algorithm and footer modes. I wanna highlight that all key metadata required to uh, read an encrypted Parquet file is stored alongside the encrypted data in the Parquet metadata. This is important because it ensures that the encrypted data is never separated from the keys that were used to encrypt them. This prevents any situation uh, you, may, you might get into where you have encrypted data and you don't know which keys should be used to decrypt it. And lastly, uh, Shinli touched on this, but the KMS is important for how we actually control who gets access to what data. This is because we control access to a column by actually controlling the ACLs on the key in the KMS. For example, if you want a certain user or a certain LDAP group to be able to read uh, a column encrypted with a certain key called key one, we would grant the user or group permissions to, to key one through the KMS. All right, so what kind of performance overhead costs are we paying to get these cool column encryption, encryption features. Our performance testing indicated roughly a 5.7% write overhead and a 3.7% read overhead for column encryption. If we break down this overhead, it comes down to two parts. One, the first part is the round trip to the KMS to, to retrieve the encryption and decryption keys. And the second part is the actual encrypting and decrypting time. We found that the network round trip to KMS was minimal in our case, uh, both because of good KMS client caching, as well as low latency uh, intranet deployment. The majority of this overhead is, actually, is spent in the actual encrypting and decrypting of the data. Please note that these tests, however, were run with 60% of columns encrypted, and most likely in practice, you'll probably find that a lot of tables require even less columns to be encrypted. Sometimes maybe down even to the 10 to 20% range. The performance overhead uh, will benefit as you reduce the percentage of columns that you need to encrypt. So the numbers might be even better than this. Okay, let's move on to the active work we are doing with data masking. So what is data masking? Data masking is just the process of office data to users who do not have privileges to access a column. If this isn't completely clear what this means, don't worry, uh, we have some example data mask queries in the next few slides, which will make it more clear. Uh, so why do we want this data masking feature? Uh, there's a few reasons. So first of all, data masking potentially enables users to do useful things without compromising the actual content of the data. Additionally, it can improve the overall user experience of using column encrypted tables. This is because if a user tries to read an encrypted column, which they don't have access to, we can just give them masked values instead of rejecting their query outright. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the different types of masks that we're working on. 
So first of all, we have the null mask. And basically what this mask does is it replaces the, the values in a, in a column that you don't have access to with null values. Also, we have something called the hash mask. This replaces uh, values with pre-computed hash values of the original data if the user doesn't have access. And also we have something called the redact mask, which displays predefined redacted data when the user doesn't have access. And lastly, we have the general user defined mask, which is basically a mask that you can define yourself. Okay, let's look, uh, let's look at the null mask and let's look at an example query here. So on the right here, we see, uh, we have an example query, select star from the sum table, db.table. And this table has three columns, uh, ID, address, and language. And let's say ID and language here are not sensitive columns. So we get back values for this, uh, from the select, like one, two, three, or English, French, English. However, address is considered a sensitive column and this user happens to not have access to the column. Under the null mask, uh, they would get back nulls instead of the actual values. So the advantage with this type of mask is that it's very simple and it's basically the bare minimum data masking feature. However, there are some limitations, like there's no joinability that's possible with this kind of mask. Uh, you can't really join on the, on the mask data. There, and there's possibility of confusion between real null values and mass null values. This is something the table owner needs to take into account when they are administrating this table and deciding whether or not to, uh, or what type of mask they want to add to a column. And lastly, we're not uh, really able to support required or not nullable columns as well with this type of mask. Okay, next we have the hash mask. So again, we have an example query here where we're selecting the same columns. Uh, this time the address column, instead of being nulled, uh, is replaced with hash values of the original data. So here the original addresses uh, were, uh, were pre, the hashes of the original address were pre-computed and uh, we get back the hashes of the addresses. So the big advantage with this hash mask is that now table joins are suddenly possible even if the user doesn't have access to the original data, like to, the encry to, to decrypt the data. However, there's still some limitations. Uh, for example, uh, it's an inefficient use of storage uh, due to compression ratios. Since we're, sto since we're storing like hash values, this kind of is not very good for compression ratios. And in terms of implementation, um, it, uh, this uh, hash mask uh, requires that hashes need to be pre-computed and stored alongside the encrypted data in the file. Okay, and now we have the redact mask. So again, we have an uh, example query, and this time we have a last name column. Uh, and then the, what the redact mask basically does is it you see a portion of the, of the data, but most of it, it is redacted. And this is, I wanna note, this is up to the control of the table owner, the table owner basically decides the level of redaction that they believe is necessary and which columns they think they should redact. Uh, and the advantage here with the redact mask is that it's probably the most human friendly mask uh, compared to like the hash mask, which is uh, these hash values. The redact mask is much more sensible for a human or user. And the limitations here is again, this is not really usable for joins. Uh, we can't support all data types so for example, string data types might make a lot of sense to redact, but if you have some integer column, that might not make sense uh, to have a redact mask on it. So it's really up to the table owner to decide which types of, which columns uh, are appropriate for which type of mask. And lastly, again, this is uh, inefficient use of storage because the redacted data needs to be pre-computed and stored in the file, uh, which is yeah, bad for storage. Okay, so here's some uh, usability and design considerations that we are taking into account as we build out this POC feature. First of all, one key observation that we made is that in a typical data ecosystem, queries are run both by humans and machines. So it's important to take into consideration when it comes to design, rollout, and implementation. Basically, data masking might be intuitive to a human, but may cause issues with automated systems. And we want uh, any solution we come up with to be flexible for both types of use cases. The second point is about clear communication between masked values and real values. 
The usability of data masking relies on users knowing and expecting masked values. Basically, we don't want to surprise users with masked values when they expect real values. And lastly, in terms of rollout, we need to aim to minimize disruption. And this goes back to the previous point of minimizing surprises. Rolling out without a well thought out strategy could break things since we're modifying query results. Okay, so let's do a quick recap on what we touched on today. So first of all, we talked about how column encryption enables fine grained control over your data sets. We talked about how, how we decide to implement column encryption at the lowest level, the parquet file format level, so that, so that to ensure protection from any access path. Permissions and ACLs are controlled at the key level by a, a pluggable a key management service. And lastly, we're working on a POC for data masking for better user experience and convenience. Lastly, I want to uh, highlight that at Uber, we're currently hiring for our team and to apply online at this link if you're interested or forward your resume to Shin Lee at this email address. And now we can take any questions. Now, there's a question about separate keys for the different columns. So the design of the POCO encryption uh, support that. So every different columns, you can have its own key. Uh, but in a real use case, if you want to use the same key, that's OK for the different column. It's, it's essentially, it depends on your requirement. For example, you have the two columns that they have the, deep, uh, have the same groups, people, to access the same column. You can use the same key, because the key is a place that where you manage the access. So doing that, you have the less number of the keys. Of course, if you want a different column, have different key, could we support that? For the redact, all user-defined mask. Can the mask the value be completely user-defined? Replace a last name with another random one, a date with a randomly shifted one. Pepe, you want to take this question? Yeah, sure. So yeah. In terms of user-defined mask, uh, yes, it can be completely user-defined. Uh, and you should be able to replace it with any random one with your own custom code. I'm not really sure what randomly shifter one is, um, but I hope I answered your question. Yeah. And another question is how ready are column level encryption and the plugin? Are they going to be part of the soon? Are you supporting nested columns? Uh, this is two questions here. One is how ready is co so column level encryption is already merged to master. It will release to Poké 12 for the plugin. Uh, so we are in the process merging to the upstream. Uh, last question is, uh, are you supporting nested column? The answer is yes. We still have a couple of more minutes. Uh, welcome questions. So we have a question here. Uh, can old parquet libraries read the new data? So I will I will take this question. Uh, so that depends. First of all, if uh, if a column is encrypted, so older version of Parquet library cannot read it because it doesn't have the decryption capability. Now, if a column is not encrypted, can all the library access it? It depends. So in the slides, I talk about encrypted footer. If you decided not to decide, uh, encrypt the footer, the answer is yes. If you decide to encrypt the footer, you cannot do it because all the library cannot decrypt the footer. OK, another question. When storing the extra data, Will we have to account for it when it, when accounting for row group size calculations? Uh, Shin, do you want to take that? And there's a second part to that. How is it stored? So it is stored as a so we uh, so there will be some uh, specification change in the Poké uh, format. Uh, the specification change is essentially adding the crypto metadata. 
So it doesn't affect the data itself. It just store more field for the crypto metadata. So it doesn't affect the root group size calculation. Next is how is what you are doing different from dynamic color masking in Hive with Ranger policies as a solution that is specific to that spec, to that stack. Um, I'm not sure the dynamic color masking you have means uh, if you are referring to the ORC encryption with Ranger policies, um, we are doing the similar ORC column encryption and Pogui column encryption has similar idea. Um, so for the Pogui encryption, the policies can be stored in uh, at many other places. Ranger policy store can also be used for the Pogui encryption. I, I think for that question, they might be referring to some masking that's happening at a higher level, maybe at the hive level. So I guess we're a bit different than that because we're doing at the lowest layer at the parquet layer. So the so we're yeah basically protecting from all paths. Like this masking is more general. Yeah. If you revert to the have UDF column encryption, um yeah, heavy on the question like we are doing the lower level uh, also means it's transparent uh, to your application like presto etc. If you do the UDF, you probably need to provide your own library UDF to do the decryption when you read the data. Okay. I will say, yeah, the question that I will say the main difference is that you can protect HDFS or S3 access using just Ranger policy. Correct. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I fully understand question um so so basically column encryption at poke is a client side encryption so the client side means the query engines like presto spark all the poke application that they do the encryption decryption as a compute and send the data across the air which is already encrypted and stored it so the storage layer is transparent to the encryption and decryption. Now come back to the key management. Essentially is where you store your key. So you establish your own uh, KMS as a standalone service. All the secret is in the KMS. Yeah, Nicola had a follow-up where they said, uh, meaning that Parquet encryption works even if you just read the files from the file system directly. And yeah, that's true. Yeah, so in the file directly from the file from the file system. Um, now, if you let's say you use the HTFS command to download the file, so the file is encrypted, partially encrypted for some columns. If you want to read those encrypted columns, you need some way to decrypt the data. For example, um, we have the plugin that you can hook in that will uh, that will well that's a wrapper of the KMS client, right? So you have the configuration on your reader, and then that will automatically get the key and pass it to the public library to the decryption, which is transparent to you. What you what you need to do is encrypt the library, provide several settings as a KMS URL, etc. More questions? Let's wait for 30 seconds. Uh, if no more questions, I think that's all for today's session.
Thanks, everybody. Uh, as PV mentioned, we are hiring. Feel free to send your resume or apply online directly. Have a good day. Thanks, Thanks everybody.